G'day guys, Jacob from The Tripod here where we break down every NRL game every week from a punting perspective and I'm here to break down NRL round eight. Now a couple of things are different tonight, you've probably already noticed uh, Alex isn't here to join me, it's his birthday so happy birthday Alex, I shudder to think what kind of state he's in right now. He usually also hosts this show and runs it through his computer, his program that puts the nice graphics up there so we've got a little bit more basic graphics tonight. And another thing that's going to be different, every week so far we've been here to celebrate winning plenty of money against the bookies and celebrating winning rounds of NRL betting. And that wasn't the case in round 8 unfortunately, a really tough round, really ugly round for us. We went 9 and 15 on our best bets which was not fun at all, uh, got a little bit back today but we are here every Sunday rain, hail or shine to face the music and talk about what happened. And on a positive note, I had the opportunity to bring Clarkie from Clarkie's Rugby League column onto the pod, and he's going to join me to recap the first six games of this round. And there were some really interesting games and some really interesting teams to talk about. So let's jump straight into it. G'day, Clarkie. Thanks for being here, mate. And what a game we get to talk about straight away. Uh, the Thursday night opener was Storm 27 defeating the Roosters 25, maybe one of the games not just of the season, but in recent memory in the regular mm. season. We went one and two on our best bets. We were in a position to sweep all three with 10 minutes to go. As we know, things then went crazy. What were your take on this one? Yeah, the last 10 minutes was easily the most craziest footy I think I've ever seen in my life. When we talk about the best games I've ever seen, recency bias always sort of slips in. And because we have recently seen that game, we might rate it over others. But I don't think that's the case here. I legitimately, Jacob, cannot sit here and tell you a game of footy I've seen that had more twists and turns than that game. What a way to start the round. And, and I just thought, like, yeah, we got it wrong. But how can you predict that? The Storm scored mm -hmm. 27 points with one line break. Like up till the, the 73rd minute or something, they scored two tries, both where they picked up a loose ball and halfway and mm -hmm. took it to the house. On the other hand, the Roosters, six line breaks. Not only do they pull teams apart, but they execute. It's a thing of beauty, isn't it? Watching them in open space. Like if you give them a sniff, they will take it. I, I have to shout at the Morris brothers again, not just what mm -hmm. they do in attack, but like, they're ragdolling people in defense. Like, they're picking up strong opponents and throwing them over the sideline and saving tries. I thought the Roosters missed Radley, but it gave an opportunity for a guy like Angus Crichton to be featured more. People forget what a talent he is. Um, and from a punting perspective, another thing, and tell me what you reckon about this, but before the season, my grand final prediction was actually Storm Eels. I thought that the Roosters mm -hmm. would struggle with the three-peat and all the riggers that go with it. Of course, this was all pre-COVID. And let's not forget Roosters lost the first two games of the season. I think Storm have been wildly underrated. They had that slip-ups, you know, against Raiders and Panthers. Winning this game without Cameron Munster just goes to show they're absolutely legit in 2020. Oh, absolutely. I uh, read them off a couple of seasons ago. I believe it was when, when Kronk departed. I said, this will be the year the Storm fall out of the top four. Cameron Smith, he can't keep up the slack of losing Kronk and Slater. But we were wrong because any team that's coached by Craig Bellamy just finds a way to win. As we saw, the Roosters for 73 minutes, their defense was legitimately brick wall. As you say, one line break. The Storm just could not find a way through. But the last seven minutes... That was enough where the Storm had just built a foundation enough where they were able to ca finally capitalize on their moments like the Roosters had been doing for the whole game. And uh, I think when I talk about this, if I if I had to sit someone down and they were new to rugby league and they'd never seen it before, I'd say, all right, we're watching this game. That's how good I thought that game was. And funnily enough, it was only six days earlier that the Eels beat the Raiders 25-24, which was a barn burner as well. Yeah. But um, it's awesome because I think lots more people around the world are watching it and what a product it is. Let's move to Friday. The Raiders beat the Dragons 22-16. It was a game of two halves. We went 2-1 and one on our best bets. Our losing best bet was Raiders to score over 23 and a half. They were up 22-0 and kicking a conversion with 25 minutes to go. Missed the conversion, didn't score again. Mm. But what was your take on this one? I think the Raiders, as a football team at the moment, they're not completely at 100%. And they don't need to be because we're not at the finals end of the business time of year. But they are still good enough to beat teams like the Dragons and more lowly recognized opposition. But honestly, what I saw here from the Raiders was I saw a team that got a little bit too comfortable, thought they had the match a little bit too easily. And whilst they did have some significant injury concerns, 
they took their foot off the pedal, which you really can't do in the NRL. The competition is too even. I think although the Raiders won here, they're still going to learn a really big lesson. And I think the next time they burst sort of a bottom four side like the Titans, um, Bulldogs, Dragons, etc., they're going to put a really big score on them and learn a lot from that. Um, but the Dragons were brave. They tried their heart out, probably just a little bit outclassed in the end, I thought. I saw it similarly. Like the old Raiders would have had that killer instinct. They would have gone on mm -hmm. with it. They Let's not forget they had lost three or four going into this. So I think there was just that bit like all they want to do is just grind out a win. They got very conservative late, which hurt our best bets. It just needed a couple yeah. more points. Uh, and the Dragons threw nothing at them first half, to be fair. Like against a better opponent, the Raiders might not have got away with that. But one thing I noticed about the Dragons, I like their mix, but I wonder if they're just waiting for Ben Hunt to come on. They don't really do anything in attack until he comes yeah, on. Right. Um, he's off playing off the bench. I mean, McInnes is a workhorse in the middle of the field. Another guy I'll shout out, Ewan Aitken, um, yeah. showing a bit of that form that had him as an origin smoky a few seasons ago. Another guy I want to talk about or who was in the news was uh, was Johnny Bateman saying he's going to leave the club. There's a lesser-known Englishman on this team that no one ever talks about. Ryan Sutton got a start at lock and actually had a great game. As you say, there's still time for this team to improve. We know what they're capable of. And if they can put it together for 80 minutes, they'll still be thereabouts at the end of the season. Another team that will also be thereabouts for sure, no doubt about it. Friday night, the late game was Eels 42, Cowboys 4. Terrible best bets on the pod behalf here. We had three of them and we lost all three because we took the Cowboys with the start. And I hate the fact that we did that because we love the Eels in 2020. We've talked them up heaps and we've talked about how we really don't rate the Cowboys but I just thought it was a bad spot for Parramatta. And we thought that after some grueling blockbusters that they've played in a row and a significant loss of Mitchell Moses, they might struggle. But in Gutho in his 100th, it was the Gutho and Sebo show. How do you like that one? I mean, the Cowboys, as you say, when you're looking for value as a tipster, as a better this season, there's just red flags over this team. They came out last week and absolutely smoked the Knights in the first half. They looked unstoppable. Um, I believe they had a big win um, earlier in the year. But they've sort of their wins have been one win, one loss, one win, one loss. This side is really struggling for consistency. And I honestly, with the performance they did put up, I, I don't see them really realistically getting over the Eels here. They were fired up for Gutho's 100th game. No Mitch Moses, no worries. The Eels... Really, really impressed me in this game, and and they, I think they sent a message to everyone that we are legitimate title threats this year. You know, in the commentary they said that statistically the Cowboys have the second best attack in the comp, and what they meant right. was they actually had the second highest average points per game. They do not have the second best attack in the comp, but I think they mm. ran up a score against the Dogs. They've scored some late tries in like when they lost to the Tigers, when they lost to the Broncos, um, and yeah. they ran up a score last week. So the stats are lying to you there if you think the Cowboys' attack is good because, I mean, they've got young halves, Shaw and Clifford and Drinkwater. Mm. Dylan Brown and Jai Field are younger and less experienced and they didn't ha have any excuses. And, yeah, we questioned the energy level of the Eels for this one, as I said, off a slew of massive games. Yeah. If anything, Gutho's 100th and Moses being out actually allowed them to refocus and it's a mark of a great team that can perform well in a bad spot against an mm. opponent you might over underestimate. They did not do that. They made mincemeat of the Cowboys who have got serious issues. We moved to a Saturday early game. It's good that I get to talk to you about a bunch of interesting teams. We'll talk about your team now. Uh, the Sharks, 40. The Titans, 10. We had two best bets and we lost them both. It's been a shocker of a round for us. Uh, first losing round of the season, unfortunately, which happens punting, but wish it wasn't this bad. We thought this would be a high-scoring game. One of our best bets was both teams to score 15-plus. Now, it was 12-10 at half time. The Titans could have easily scored 15-plus yeah. in the first half if they knew how to draw and pass when they made a break. There were 28 points in the second half. Problem was they were all by the Sharks. Um, one bright spot, we did actually tip Corey Thompson to be the first Titans try scorer, paying 8 bucks. This was when we heard Roberts was moving to fullback and Thompson to the wing. That was great value, and a bunch mm -hmm. of the boys did fill up so crashing back to earth for the Titans after a really impressive win last week. Um, although Tyron Roberts is back, I thought the decision to move Corey Thompson away from fullback was absolutely ludicrous. Um, I, I, there was some positives. Bo Firma obviously made a couple good line breaks, but he, he, like you say, simple footy. You have to execute a draw and pass. You look at the best teams like the Roosters, they're executing three-on-threes and they're still scoring somehow through the brilliant security. The Titans had a three-on-one with a, a second row, charging at a fullback, 
and we botched it somehow. And I was left sitting there scratching my head at all the all the opportunities missed, I suppose, whereas the Sharks are a bit more clinical. They took their opportunities when they were presented, and believe me, they were presented <laughs> quite a few. And um, a really tough game to watch, I suppose, as a Titans fan. And a guy you posted about on your page this morning, we've got to give credit where it's due, Sean Johnson. He's oh, killing yeah. it. Uh, and you posted that he's leading the league in try assists, right? And he's yep. a nightmare for defensive left edges. I talked about this in the preview pod, like, because he can drop it on the boot on a dime perfectly and behind the winger if they rush up. He's got the short ball, got that connection with Nakora or bringing Ramian and obviously Katoa into the game. And in general, the Sharks quietly have won three in a row yeah. in a season where they have faced a lot of adversity and have had plenty of excuses so give them credit and they certainly went on with this one another game that's going to be interesting to talk about I'm oh, interested yeah. to hear your thoughts on this one Warriors 26 Broncos 16 the pain did not stop for our best bets because we had three the most painful probably Broncos to score over 11 and a half in the first half they had 10 Izako hit the post on his conversion that's right. um, and we saw so we lost all three of our tips and, like, no disrespect to the Warriors, but it's, like, just all the circumstances, everything that's been against them, Kearney, RTS was suspended this week. I thought it was a huge opportunity for Brisbane's playing group to step up, not just the pressure on Seabold, but the pressure on the whole club. I thought they'd be too good in this one. I was wrong. And they were 10-0 up. They got outscored 26-6 to the rest of the way. So, hand over to you. Are you going to celebrate the Warriors' win, or do you want to eulogize the Broncos? Oh, well, I mean, you've got to give credit where credit's due. The Warriors to get a win without RTS. And we can't remember, the uh, forget the last two times these uh, two teams met. I believe it was at Suncorp Stadium last year and the game went to a draw. And RTS ran for, I believe, 350 metres. Jazz Tavanga had 77 tackles. Both of those players were out. And they were their best players the last time uh, these two teams faced. It was just exceptional for the Warriors. They hung in. They dug deep. But then we have to speak about the other side of the, 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 the coin, I suppose. And the Broncos were just... Horrible. There's really no other word to describe it. You know, three minutes to go. Everyone's crying from the Broncos fans. They're crying out saying, everyone, we've got to get rid of Milford. Let's get Tom Dearden in. And then Tom Dearden makes a, a, a high school error, knocking it on out the back of a scrum, puts them under pressure. The Warriors score and seal the game. When you're calling for a player to be dropped, and every fan unanimously agrees that this is the guy that must come in and replace, and he's making errors like that, in not an 80-minute performance coming off the bench, it really spells disaster. I mean, you have players like Payne Haas that try their heart out, but because he's trying so hard and Anthony Seabold isn't utilizing a proper bench rotation, he's missing easy tackles now. His game is being affected. I, I And there, there are a couple rumors going around with some stuff happening in Anthony Seabold's personal life, how much that plays into what's happening with the club right now, I don't know, but it is an absolute mess one thing I would love to bring up, earlier in the week when Corey Oates was informed he would be dropped, he came out and said a quote. He said, I'm pissed off. I don't think I, I, don't think I deserved it. Um, I think a couple of other players deserved it. Something, don't, don't quote me quote for, word for word, but something along that. And you look at the Eels and how the Eels researched from a wooden spoon. It was Mitchell Moses looking himself in the mirror and saying, no excuses, I wasn't good enough. It was every other Eels player looking each other in the eyes and saying, we're not good enough for each other. Whereas you look at the Broncos, you've got players like Corey Oates saying, I'm pissed off I was dropped. I didn't deserve it. They need to have a completely, a complete cultural, just a complete overhaul of everything there to the point where if Corey Oates is getting dropped, he's looking in the mirror and going, I need to be better for my teammates, not next week. Not, oh, I'm entitled because I'm an origin winger and now I'm pissed off. Can't have that attitude in, in professional footy. Warriors, fantastic. Broncos, six losses in a row. Something really needs to change fast. I think you hit the nail on the head with culture there. A guy that comes to mind for me is Benji Marshall, man of the match mm -hmm. in round one. You know, instrumental in, in their wins for the Tigers. Got dropped. He doesn't throw his toys out of the cot. He's still there being around the boys and doing what he can to help the team. You know, before the season, I will take credit that I didn't pick the Broncos to make the eight when most did. And everyone said, oh, Croft will be the missing piece. He'll come and he'll steer this team around. And I was saying, like, they haven't signed Mitchell Pierce or DCE. Like, they've signed a young kid who's decent, but they already had a decent halfback in Dearden. So to yeah. me, like, why was this guy deemed the saviour when mm -hmm. ultimately the Storm didn't pick him in their strongest 17 
when they were contesting the finals in either of the past two seasons. Thought it was too much pressure on Croft. I personally, I don't want to bag Seabold, but I think his position is untenable at this point because the players can cry and say they're giving their best effort. But for me, it wasn't just effort. It was lack of discipline. It was horrible effort uh, errors at horrible times. It was terrible forced passes that were just stupidity. He always, every week, says it's a lack of execution. Well, coach has to take responsibility for execution. Either they're being coached to play this way or they're not listening to the coach, and I'm not sure which is worse. Massive credit to the Warriors. They showed a ton of heart, as I said, with the guys that are out, and they were down in this game. You know, they threw an intercept try. They had a lot of reasons for, to quit, to be honest. Three standouts I have to shout out. Blake Green, he kicked a game-changing 40-20 when they were down 16-12, yep. and they were actually struggling to get out of their end. And it yep. pretty much flipped the game. And his his control, especially when they lost Nicarima early, was brilliant. Mm-hmm. Tohu Harris leads their forwards every week. And Kenny Marmolo, we talk about him as a superstar. He did superstar things in this game. He was fantastic. But Brisbane yeah. is a dumpster fire right now. Last one I've got you here to share your thoughts on. It was a great game. It was Panthers 19, Tigers 12. And it sums up our tips because we liked the Panthers to cover the line. We thought there could be a couple extra points in games this week with um, the further rules towards the six again and, and set restarts. But we went one and two. We had the Panthers to score over nine and a half in the first half. Scored a converted try in the first minute. Didn't score again in the half. Yeah. We had them to score over 19 and a half points. They scored exactly 19. But in saying that, we had Panthers minus four. And we're lucky to, to cover minus four because it was a tight game. In fact, you told me you predicted extra time and it was 12 all with 10 minutes to go before yeah. some classy plays by the Panthers. What did you think about that one? Oh, excellent game of footy. The emotion was there. I love games where it's a tight scoreline and the forward packs are battling and there's emotion out there with the players. Um, there was just so many twists and turns in this one also, despite the scoreline being low. There was times where the Panthers looked unstoppable after scoring in the first two minutes, and you thought, well, they're really going to kick on here. The Tigers, I said, the Tigers need to adjust here. There's something not right. But then the classiness of the Tigers, they adjust. And all of a sudden, they're the ones piling the pressure on the Panthers, and you're just wondering, when is the tries going to come? Both teams were superb, really, really excellent in defense. It was a top-class game. Really enjoyed it. Panthers, they are on fire. They're going to take a lot away from this. A lot of confidence as well, given the sort of... I wouldn't classify these two teams as classic rivals, but they are a modern rival, given the coaching switch of Ivan Cleary. You saw him after the game blowing kisses to the fans of the Tigers. It meant a lot to them. And um, I love this game, to sum it up, yeah. And they are both kind of Western Sydney clubs as well. This week, we actually gave out a futures tip. We don't give a lot, but we gave out Panthers to win the minor premiership. At $7, and there's a few reasons for that. Obviously, we really like what they're about this year and, and the, the way they're playing. Also, the key injuries to the teams above them, Moses, Munster, Radley all went out that you know the same week. They are currently just one point behind the Eels, and they have the best draw of any contender, and they have the least injuries. So that bet is looking decent. I mean, they will play the Eels, and they'll be at home in roughly like round 18. That could, that could be for the minor prem. It'll be thereabouts. Mm. A lot has been said of the Panthers' spine. Edwards was injured to start the year, so that people were questioning who should be the best fullback. It was Luai or Burton at 5'8". Cleary had the TikTok gate and missed a couple games. And Coruscant is new to the club. But now those four players are all set in their positions. They are the best spine right now. That is the right mix. And they're only going to get better each week, which is scary. I thought it was a typical Tigers performance, like they're tough. But sometimes being tough isn't enough against mm the elite of the of the comp and their frustrations got the better of them at the end um look mate we're this is sunday morning we're recording these games i massively appreciate you jumping on and, and breaking it down with me um so the next two games people will just see my quick reaction that i'll record later this afternoon and this will be obviously playing sunday night but if you guys don't follow clarky already jump on instagram and facebook clarky's rugby league column do yourself a favor i think if you hit a hundred thousand likes on facebook yet or you must be getting so close. Low, so so close. and and clarky has told me that he will give a hundred grand to his hundred thousandth like <laughs> so like his page you said that right yeah 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 definitely yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so stay tuned for that maybe if one of our big multis gets up 
So thanks again to Clarkie who joined me to cap the last six games. Now I'll give you my rapid reaction to the two that finished today. The early Sunday game, Knights 14 defeated the Seagulls 12. We had four best bets. We went three and one. So finally back on track today. The one loss we had, we liked the Knights, but we had them to win the second half in a two-way market. They were up eight at half time. They only held on and won by two. So that was the loss. And boy, they were probably lucky to win by two. If you saw the final play, Manly had to go 90 meters to score a try in the final minute. They nearly did. They made a break, kicked ahead. There was pretty obvious push in the back. I thought would have been a Manly penalty from the sideline. So just the way this round's gone, I'm surprised that the Knights held on and won by two. We had the minus one and a half. Gritty game, which was how Manly was going to play it at Brookvale. That was their only chance. Cherry Evans was immense, honestly. And he also got a sin bit in this game. But when he was out there, he was huge and scored a try that got them back in it, as was Trebojevic. I thought... McCulloch's best game for the club um, since joining the Novocastrians and Kalen Pong, it's not going to show up in the stat sheet, but he had a number of really important plays to get him out of trouble and avoid handing over repeat sets to Manley. And finally, to cap the round, another winning game. Rabbitohs 26 defeated the Bulldogs 10. We had three best bets. We won two and lost one. The one we lost we had minus five and a half in the first half. They were up eight, but conceded a late trial for kick. Only led by two at half time. And the game, I wouldn't say in the balance. I felt the Rabbitohs were always in control, but the Dogs didn't go away. They had to withstand a lot of pressure in this game. The Dogs, just same old story that's been in 2020. They just don't have enough go-to options and enough to offer in attack to conjure up a try when they need one. The Rabbitohs held their line, had a 10-point lead, we had it minus nine and a half, and we had minus five and a half in the second half. So we were sitting in a position to win both those bets. The Rabbitohs gave away a penalty very late in the game, and the Doggies, for all money, were going to score a try that was going to reverse sweep, which would have just been absolutely apt end to the way this round has been for the pod. And Dane Gagai, the miracle player, we've seen him do it more than one time, including uh, in a maroon jersey, pulls an intercept and a two-on-one, takes it back the other way. While the intercept saved a try that helped us win those bets, we didn't need him to score. But I know a lot of you guys following did need him to score if you had Rabbitohs 13 plus or anything like that. So that's a miracle for anyone that had that type of bet. Uh, Alex Johnston came up huge with a try and a um, couple of massive plays as well, including an intercept to save points too. So I'll, I'll pull one out for the Rabbitohs wingers in that game. And we finished the round 9-15, and 15, which is shocking, of course, but at least we salvaged it with a 5-2 and two Sunday. Uh, we'll be back to normal Wednesday night, 6 p.m. to preview round 9. Beware of a pod bounce back. Lego.